everybody. It is Monday, April 8th, Eclipse Day here in North America. You're listening to the Mo News Podcast. I'm Moshe Mununu. And I'm Jill Wagner. This is the place where we bring you just the facts. And we read all the news and read between the lines so you don't have to. And we'll look at the sun so you don't have to as well, <laughs> Jill. <laughs> I don't think mine, for anybody who's watching on YouTube, Moshe just put on his eclipse glasses. I don't know if mine are red and white striped like that. Jill, Jill, Jill my eclipse glasses have our American flag themed. <laughs> Um, number one, uh, for those of you listening, I put on my eclipse glasses. If you've tried these glasses, I didn't realize they're like pitch black unless you're looking at the sun. You know, they're a thousand times stronger than regular sunglasses. And so they have no use besides staring at the sun, apparently. Right. So that's how you know they're real, actually. So my husband bought eclipse glasses for, for me and him and also mm -hmm. for my parents. And so my dad said, or how do we know they're real? And then he found out, he, he said, if you look at a regular light and you could see the regular light through the glasses, that is not good. Yeah. It, it still has to be pitch black, even if you are looking at a regular light. Yes, though we will get into the details here. Jill, I heard from some ophthalmologists in the Mo News community over the weekend who warn, uh, say they've been seeing patients from the 2017 eclipse who still have damage in their eyes. And uh, so fair warning, even with the eclipse glasses, doesn't mean you should stare up there the entire time. Uh, you know, the, you don't look at the sun on a regular day especially on a day where, where the moon is in front of it. Uh, and so just fair warning, though, um, we'll have the details for you here uh, in New York. Uh, I will be on standby from about 2.51 p.m. today through 3.58 p.m. That's the time period where the sky will begin to darken and then begin to lighten up. And then at 3.25, we in New York City, Joe, will get a 90% uh, eclipse, not a hundred percent, not total eclipse, but pretty damn close. Note to self, do not schedule any important meetings with Mosh between those hours. Me, Mosh, can we have a, a, me, an all Jill, hands at three 30? Jill, Jill, let's, let's, <laughs> let's talk about this. There is no productivity here in like the Eastern half of the country, <laughs> uh, you know, half the country today. Uh, if you do work on the West coast and you're trying to coordinate with some of the East coast, like after noon today, like there ain't much work getting done. Like, let's be very clear about this. Okay, so let's get to the headlines here. What you need to know about today's solar eclipse, including how to photograph it. An earthquake hit the Northeast, and all we got was this meme. <laughs> Did you Women feel it? <laughs> I only felt the aftershock, but we'll, we'll talk about it when, when we get to that story. Women are the ones to watch this March Madness. South Carolina completes their perfect season on the women's side, and the men's tournament winner gets crowned tonight. What men's championship? <laughs> it's a great question. Uh, this is all about the women this year. Increasing tension in Latin America. Ecuador raids the Mexican embassy to arrest a leader hiding there. What all of this means. To the Middle East, Israel withdraws most of its troops from southern Gaza. What that means for the war and Israel's relationship with the United States. Insurers are spying on your home from the sky and dropping tens of thousands of people from their insurance policies. After three months without a grand prize Powerball winner, someone in Oregon is $1.3 billion richer. Advice from the world's oldest living man and how it involves fish and chips. Jill, I'm rethinking my daily diet based on what this guy's been eating. <laughs> and Moshe is on this day in history. Jill, your clue today, I got a fever and the only prescription is more cowbell. <laughs> I don't know. I'm you to, out. You had to be there for a certain period at Saturday Night Live. Anyway, we'll have that and more on this day in history. Okay, so let's start with today's total eclipse. More than 100 million people across North America are expected to take a few minutes this afternoon to take in a rare total solar eclipse over at least a dozen states. The moon will cross the sun and will block its light for a few fleeting moments. It is a communal experience that will not again be available to people in the United States, Canada, or Mexico until... 
2044. The total solar eclipse's path is the expanse where the moon fully obscures the sun. It stretches from Mexico's Pacific coast to the Atlantic coast of Canada, passing over cities like Austin, Dallas, Little Rock, Indianapolis, Cleveland, Buffalo, and Montreal. You do have to be in a 100-mile wide path to get the full experience the moon starts to conceal the sun near Mazatlan, Mexico at 9.51 a.m. local time. Viewers near Mazatlan will experience totality at 11.07 a.m. for four minutes and 20 seconds. And then the moon shadow will swoop through Mexico, crossing over the Texas border at 1.10 p.m. Eastern time. Totality in the United States will start at 2.27 p.m. And then it will make its way north of the border in Canada in the eastern part of the country, you can experience the solar eclipse in the afternoon for a three hour time span somewhere in, in that period. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people are looking at their weather forecast today, Jill. Weather wise, it is not great for Mexico and Texas, but looking better for most of the rest of the country with some cloud cover as the eclipse moves. Uh, I read that it moves at a pace of between 2,000 and 3,000 miles per hour, hence why you only get to see it for anywhere from two to four minutes. Uh, this is in the area of totality, again, the complete blockage of the sun. Now, if you are not in the path of totality, you could see partial eclipsing of the sun, like those of us in the New York area. Most will see about 90% blockage of the sun. At the extremes, you've got South Florida and Seattle will get close to a 10% blockage. The rest of us, somewhere in the middle. A reminder as to the science here. So the Earth orbits the sun and the moon orbits the Earth. As both the Earth and the Moon move once in a while, we are all in alignment. Now, the Moon is about 400 times smaller than the Sun, but it is about 400 times closer to us. So that means that when these, so that means that when the two of them are aligned, they appear to be the same size in the sky for a few minutes, and that is happening today. Now, as we talk about watching the eclipse, your friendly reminder. You need eclipse glasses, and they are not the same as regular sunglasses. Eclipse glasses let in thousands of times less light than regular sunglasses, and you should not look directly at the sun. Staring directly at the sun, even for a few seconds, can cause permanent damage to your eyes, and this can range from blurry or distorted vision to something even more serious like blind spots, because there are no pain receptors in the retina, you won't actually feel the damage while it's happening. Yeah, Jill, we posted over on the premium account this weekend, uh, some notes we got from folks who said, I'm staying indoors because I still see dark spots uh, in my vision from the 2017 eclipse. Uh, I, I, we also had a ophthalmologist in the Monus community who wrote in saying, as an ophthalmologist, a lot of people come to my office thinking they can look for a second or two, since they've been able to look at the sun for a second or two with no issues. This is very different. When you look at a non-eclipse, your pupils constrict. Uh, during a partial eclipse, there's not as much light. Uh, basically, this is effectively what, what they say is a sunburn to your eye uh, during an eclipse because of the way that uh, the moon blocking it really uh, focuses the light uh, and could create damage. So while they do say that at the point of total darkness, you can look up, color me skeptical. Uh, I'd rather not lose my vision here. So uh, just be careful, everybody. We have a link in the uh, show notes as well as in the newsletter today on how to create uh, a safer way to take in the eclipse today, uh, what's called a pinhole projector. Effectively, you can poke a tiny hole in a piece of paper back to the sun. So you have your back to the sun. You take that piece of paper and you hold it in front of you so it projects light through that hole onto another piece of paper. That's how you can take in the eclipse without looking directly at the sun. You could also use a colander from your kitchen, uh, I have read. So if you Google like alternate pinhole projectors, there's a lot of uh, advice out there as well as the uh, link again in our newsletter today. But to be clear, if you do have those special eclipse glasses, yeah. you can look at the sun. Yes, if you have the eclipse glasses, you can look up. I guess what I'm hearing from folks is you shouldn't just spend the entire day looking, you know, you shouldn't just be locked on the sun uh, the entire time, like even with the eclipse glasses is what I'm told. Got it. So, so the point is, is that even with the glasses, you still do need to be careful. Be careful, be in, in, in moderation that I, I'm not sure... It's an experiment. Uh, Jill, 
Jill, I imagine some people will be fine at the same time, you know, given sensitivity. The sun's a powerful thing. So I guess take it in sort of, you know, what your parents always taught you at a, at a, at a restaurant or in public. Don't stare. Just, you know, sort of glance. <laughs> well, it is a big deal um, amongst schools right now because they're all trying to figure out what their plans are. I know a lot of schools in my area are actually dismissing early mm. because they don't want to even have to deal with the kids and the sunglasses. My daughter's school, every kid gets a pair of glasses, a pair of the Eclipse glasses, and they're going to be walking out to the bus because it is a big deal. How do you tell a kid, don't look when you say that, yeah. you know that that's the first thing they do <laughs> is look. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I hate to read some of the stories that we'll be getting in the coming days with people who are like making a bet, you know, whatever. Anyway, needless to say, stay safe, everybody. Um, notably, Jill, we actually get a total eclipse on Earth about about once every year and a half. The issue is it's always at different angles based on the way the earth is rotating, the way based on the based on the way the earth is rotating, where the moon is. And so most of the time when we have a total eclipse, the, it crosses areas that are mainly ocean or uninhabited land. So that's why this is so rare. Uh, that this is crossing what is a very populated area. There will be one in a couple of years that crosses Iceland and parts of Europe that I think some people are making plans for. And we will get a sense uh, in the next day or two of how many people experience this. The estimate from 2017 is uh, 150 million plus Americans watched the eclipse in person that year. That's when it made a crisscross from the northwest to the southeast. That's more people than watch the Super Bowl. Uh, and there's even more people who live in the path of totality here. Uh, you also have a number of people, millions of people, who have uh, made their way to the path of totality. If you actually look at Airbnb bookings uh, and you put them on a map, it literally, uh, you see all the bookings on that angle. The, the busiest area for Airbnbs tells you exactly where the path of totality is. One thing to watch today is animals. Uh, birds stop chirping. Bees stop buzzing. Pets may experience some confusion. Uh, some experts say that the best thing to do is keep your pets inside at home to avoid unnecessary stress uh, for your cats and dogs. Mass gatherings also with emotional reactions sometimes are not good for pets. So you know your pet best, but that's something to keep in mind here. And then there is photography because... Were you ever really there if you don't have a mediocre picture of the eclipse on your phone, Joe? Well, the cool thing is, is that we have somebody on the ground in the path of totality. So we, so if you're nervous about being outside and looking up at the eclipse, head over to Instagram because we'll be covering it on our account. And we'll also be taking in, uh, you know, photos from professional photographers who have bought special filters uh, in order to take those pictures. So if you're really fancy, you probably already have one of those filters uh, for your phone lens or for a professional DSLR camera. Uh, for the rest of us, you can actually try pressing your Eclipse glasses up to the lens um, of your iPhone before totality when the skies temporarily darken to eliminate the light coming in. And then when totality happens, remove the filter or glasses. They're no longer needed then for your iPhone camera. One suggestion here, and again, we'll include a link in the show notes here, to focus your phone's camera on the Eclipse, try using the focus lock feature. That's effectively when you tap your screen where you'd like to focus, you hold it until you see that AEAF lock alert um, on your camera, and that'll keep your phone on the area, the key area, the sun, uh, in focus. So again, we'll have a link in show notes uh, that'll explain that step by step for how to take your iPhone pictures. So. You know, that'll be Instagram, Jill, for the next 24 hours. Okay, let's talk more science, Mosh. How about that earthquake that rattled the northeastern United States on Friday morning just after about 10.20 a.m.? Did you feel it? I felt the first one, Jill. In fact, at Mo News headquarters uh, in uh, Brooklyn, we're right between the Manhattan Bridge, the Brooklyn Bridge, and two subway lines. So like many New Yorkers, I was like, wow, that was a big truck or like the subway, like passed in a way that didn't feel right. But then about 10 seconds into it, I was like, oh, no, this is an earthquake. It immediately recalled memories for me of being in Japan. Uh, I was there for aftershocks after the Fukushima earthquake uh, back in uh, 2011. And those aftershocks in Japan were like 7.5, 7.8. So uh, again, weaker, but still felt like shaking, felt the dust shaking. It, it was it was real. Well, according to the U.S. Geological Survey, a 4.8 magnitude quake was centered just outside of White House Station, New Jersey. It's about 50 miles west of New York City. 
It could be felt as far south as Washington, D.C. and as far north as Boston. And then just over seven hours later, we had an aftershock, a 4.0 magnitude that was centered near Gladstone, New Jersey. Jill, that was the one you felt. <laughs> you felt the 4.0. So, somehow, so I was in a store. And there were a lot of other people there. And I guess I was just so busy chatting that about you missed 15 the first one. seconds later, yeah. yeah, someone's like, was that an earthquake? Was that an earthquake? And then I looked on the phone and I saw that indeed there was an earthquake, which I did not feel. And then seven hours later, I was in my house cooking and kind of like what you experienced where you thought it was the subway. I thought it was actually my washing machine, which sometimes gets a little rowdy <laughs> during certain <laughs> phases of the cycle. And then I was like, this feels really weird. And I actually got nervous. I was like, maybe I should go turn the washing machine off. And then it ended. And I looked at my phone and it was like, no, it was an aftershock. <laughs> I was like, I felt, I really did feel FOMO about missing the first earthquake. So at least I felt the aftershock. I felt a little bit better. You, you, you got in on the party on the tail end. <laughs> Okay, so the earthquake was the strongest in New Jersey in 250 years since 1783. It was the strongest felt in the New York City area since 1884. Buildings throughout New York City were inspected for structural integrity and damage. Thankfully, there are no reports of major damage or injuries. Some minor damage in New Jersey, but all buildings are structurally sound. The quake was really more of a novelty, inspiring memes and jokes online. Jill, have you gotten the I survived the 2024 quake with a lawn chair knocked over? Uh, I like the one with just the cone, like the traffic cone <laughs> over. And it's the type of thing where it's like, who knows, that traffic cone was probably knocked over to begin with. At the same time, though, it did reveal some apparent shortcomings in New York's emergency notification system. Coming after the Mayor Adams administration has been criticized for a delayed response to floods and wildfire smoke. On Friday, beeping text alerts warning residents to stay indoors were received a half hour or more after the earthquake hit. And Mosh, if you thought that was bad, so I saw what you posted about the city alert. Yeah. About an hour after that, I got one from New York State where I was like, you've got to be joking. It was the same alert, but it was from the state a full 90 minutes after the earthquake. We do some things well on the East Coast and some things not so well, <laughs> and earthquakes are not among them. Because in earthquake-prone areas like California, Japan, um, areas across Asia, there's a network of seismic sensors that detect shaking. So alerts actually arrive seconds before a quake when it would be useful. Uh, and that's something the West Coasters uh, mocked us for for a variety of reasons, including just all the commotion we made about a 4.8 quake, which is pretty routine for people who live on the West Coast. But Jill, as I told uh, folks on Instagram, you know we're prepared for a lot of things in New York City. It's chaos on the subway, a lot of craziness here, but we're just not built for quakes. It's like not a thing that we know how to do, at least not so far, but maybe after the experience of Friday, some of us will feel more adept at it. But I will tell everyone, and we posted this Friday afternoon on the uh, main Instagram feed, there is actually a scientific reason for why a 4.8, which again is like a, a nothing burger on the West Coast, actually feels more significant here in the East. Yes. <laughs> So it turns out, are you ready for your geological lesson of the day? The rock in the eastern U.S. is much older than the rock in the West. For example, the Appalachian Mountains are some of the oldest mountains in the world, forming hundreds of millions of years before the North American ranges. In fact, if you really want to get scientific about it, when we were all one continent called Pangaea, and Africa was attached to North America, was attached to Europe, technically speaking, the Appalachian Mountain Range, partially today, the northern end of it is in Scotland, and the southern end of it is in Morocco. So that just to give you a sense of where that range first started. Anyway, the point of all this is that we in the east have older, denser rock, and that allows seismic waves to cross them more effectively when an earthquake occurs, which means that the energy released can travel a further distance because of the nature of our rock. So when a 4.8 happens in New Jersey, it's felt all the way in D.C. and all the way up to Boston, whereas a 4.8 uh, in California would be felt in a much smaller area because this fractured rock you have in the west, the energy is absorbed in the falls and dissipates much faster. So okay west coast the 4.8 feels like a bigger deal here because it does because it is 
<laughs> so take that, California. <laughs> like, like we don't have the San Andreas fault. We don't have the Cascadia fault that you have in Seattle, the Hayward fault. You know what? We have the Ramapo, New Jersey fault, <laughs> and it does pack a little bit of a punch. <laughs> All right, time for the speed read. Let's start with some sports from the Athletic. South Carolina defeated Iowa 87 to 75 on Sunday to win the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament. It is the third championship for the Gamecocks. They have won two out of the last three tournaments. The win completed South Carolina's perfect 38-0 season, which made it the first undefeated national champion since 2016 and the 10th team to do so in history. The Gamecocks have lost one game over the past two seasons, And that loss last year was to Iowa in the final four. South Carolina's Tessa Johnson led the Gamecocks with 19 points. Camilla Cardoza, the game's most outstanding player, had 15 points and 17 rebounds. The loss prevents Iowa's Caitlin Clark from having the perfect end to her college career after becoming the all-time highest point scorer. Yeah, she owns uh, some incredible records there, but two straight years was not able to uh, win the championship. Nonetheless, she's expected to be the top pick in the women's NBA draft. She already has a number of endorsement deals, and she got some really incredible praise, um, Jill, after the game. South Carolina coach Dawn Staley, you know, her team victorious on the floor celebrating, makes a point of calling out and praising Caitlin Clark, um, a lot of expectations now going in to what she can mean to the WNBA, Jill. So, Mosh, my husband and I were commenting because we are huge March Madness fans. He's like, I watched so much more women basketball this year, this entire season than yeah. men's and especially during the tournament. And I have to tell you, we were watching the game on Sunday, which was a great game. It was actually neck and neck until the last few minutes. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> when South Carolina just kind of ran away with it. But there were points where it was still close. And even the coach afterward, I was tearing up watching her and her emotions and the rest of the team. Just so happy for them. And I did appreciate that she mentioned Caitlin Clark because I just thought good sportsmanship is so incredibly important. But look, Caitlin Clark has sparked a lot of interest. And it's been great to see for women's sports in general. Yeah, it was actually the um, cold open of Saturday Night Live uh, made this point. They were joking with like a, you know, Keenan Thompson playing Charles Barkley, et cetera. And they were all making the joke like, wait, there's a men's tournament happening this year? Like, I've only been paying attention to the women. And that's where the conversation went. And now that you mentioned Charles Barkley and some of the commentators, notable as well that all of the the commentators were women, were players or coaches or whatnot, but a, a full female lineup that was also really nice to see. Yeah, and I'm sure we'll see some uh, incredible ratings numbers, too. The ratings have been through the roof uh, for the women's games this tournament. As for the men, though, they will have their championship game tonight. March Madness started with 68 teams. Now there are two on the men's side playing at 9.20 p.m. Eastern tonight. UConn and Purdue in the championship game. The final between the two number one seeds uh, will take place in Glendale, Arizona. UConn beat Alabama over the weekend. Purdue beat NC State to get to the final round. Notably here, UConn are the defending national champions. And with a win tonight, they would be the first back-to-back winners in 20 years uh, in the men's tournament. One big matchup to watch tonight is the battle of the big men, UConn's Donovan Klingon and Purdue's Zach Eady. Both of them arguably have been the best players uh, through this tournament. Uh, so you'll have a seven foot four ED up against a seven foot two Klingon. So that should be interesting to watch, though the game is so late, Jill, especially on the East Coast. So uh, I don't know that you'll be staying up for it, but I'll try to make sure that we have it updated for uh, tomorrow's pod. Much appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> one, one more college basketball item before we go here. We learned Friday that the son of LeBron James. Bronny James has declared for the NBA draft after just one season of college. He's a guard who played for the he's a guard who played one season for the University of Southern California. Uh, though he did have cardiac arrest last summer, so his play was limited uh, in this season. He's filing in a way that will let him return to college if he's not drafted. Uh, though notably, LeBron has said he does not want to retire 
until he gets a chance to play with his son in the NBA. So uh, we'll all be watching that and see if uh, Bronny uh, gets drafted. Now to an international headline we're following from Reuters. Mexico's government ended diplomatic ties with Ecuador after police broke into the Mexican embassy over the weekend to arrest a former Ecuadorian vice president. It took place in Quito, Ecuador's capital, and it is an extraordinary use of force that shocked and mystified leaders as a country's embassy is considered sovereign territory, we shared pictures over the weekend of Ecuadorian police late Friday breaking through the external doors of the Mexican embassy to arrest Ecuadorian Vice President Jorge Glass. He had been residing there since December and was seeking political asylum at the embassy after being indicted on corruption charges in Ecuador. The raid had prompted Mexico's president, Andre Lopez Obrador, to announce the breaking of diplomatic relations with Ecuador, and the move will be challenged at the World Court in The Hague. So a very rare move here, you could say unprecedented, Jill, uh, in terms of what happened in Quito over the weekend. Authorities in Ecuador have been investigating Glass for alleged irregularities during his management of reconstruction efforts in the country, effectively a, a whole bunch of bribery and corruption charges that he's been convicted on and more that he's accused of. And so he sought refuge inside the Mexican embassy in the country. The office of the Ecuadorian president defended the raid, saying Ecuador is a sovereign nation. We will not allow any criminal to stay free. The Mexican president fired back, saying this is an authoritarian act. This is a violation of international law. Again, diplomatic premises are considered the territory of that country. Local law enforcement agencies are not allowed to enter without the permission of the ambassador. Consider each embassy a piece of that country within your country. Well, the Ecuadorians didn't seem to care. They wanted to get this former VP. Uh, he's now in jail. Uh, notably, Jill, sort of ironically, people seeking asylum have lived for days or years inside embassies around the world. One of the most notable ones, Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, lived in the Ecuadorian embassy in London for seven years. Which is longer than I've ever lived anywhere. So, <laughs> Someone actually asked me over the weekend, what is it like living in an embassy? And I was like, I can't tell you, but there's certainly not... <laughs> <laughs> place that I want to stay at for a long time. You're living in an office. So I imagine there's a cot and a bathroom and maybe a shower. Who knows? I guess it really depends on the country. It depends on the embassy and depends on, you know, how much room they've given. You. Staying overseas from Sky News, the latest from the Middle East, the Israeli military announced Sunday that it was withdrawing all troops from southern Gaza leaving just one brigade in the Palestinian territory. It comes as this weekend marks six months of the Israel-Gaza war since the initial Hamas terror attack on October 7th. The Israeli military has been reducing numbers in Gaza since the start of the year to relieve reservists. Similar to what we saw in northern Gaza, it is similar to what took place in northern Gaza after several months of a large-scale offensive with several divisions. The Israeli Defense Forces left northern Gaza a few months ago only to return to carry out smaller, localized operations. The IDF believes that smaller raids, like a recent operation at Shifa Hospital taking out several hundred members of Hamas, are a more effective way to operate against the terror group moving forward. And it comes as the U.S. has been putting pressure on Israel to wrap up the war. Yeah, the Israelis wouldn't say publicly that this came because of the U.S., but certainly an interesting coincidence here, given the conversation that has been taking place recently between Biden, Netanyahu, other senior officials. Now, one major Israeli brigade does continue uh, to remain in Gaza. It secures the corridor in central Gaza that effectively splits the Gaza Strip in half, uh, preventing Palestinians from going back north, but also coordinating with humanitarian groups uh, and conducting uh, these ongoing raids, uh, as Jill just mentioned. Now, the Israelis have a reserve army, so a lot of these um, individuals may have not been home for six months, and so they're being so they're being given the opportunity to return home here. Remember, all of them have full-time jobs. They, you know, remember the vast majority of them have full-time jobs. And so this has taken an economic hit on the country. Uh, so uh, at this point, it appears they're returning most home uh, with the ability to potentially return them at any given point. And as I mentioned, it does come as there have been these ongoing talks with the U.S., the U.S. calling on the Israelis 
to open up aid corridors, uh, find ways to relieve pressure on Gazan civilians. It comes as the death toll has surpassed 33,000 right now in the Gaza Strip. The estimate is that at least half are civilians, slightly less than half combatants. Again, you know, you're going off of Hamas estimates here, Israeli estimates here. The bottom line is it is a humanitarian disaster right now in the Gaza Strip. Uh, and that's been the core contention um, in recent weeks uh, and days between uh, most of the West uh, and the Israeli government. The question is now, what will happen with the only part of Gaza that the Israelis don't control? That's the city of Rafah in the south, where there's one and a half million estimated displaced Palestinians. That's also where the Israelis say there are four remaining Hamas battalions. Uh, there were 24 at the start of the war. The Israelis say they've destroyed 18 battalions. There's four remaining in Rafah. And so the Israelis have been saying for about two months now they need to go into Rafah. There's been a lot of pushback there, again, particularly because of the potential civilian toll that could take place uh, if Israel conducts a full-on ground invasion of Rafah. So the Americans keep asking the Israelis for a plan. Uh, and uh, I'm told that this... Uh, withdrawal that happened over the weekend does not preclude a Rafah operation, uh, but it does come as there's ongoing uh, temporary ceasefire talks in Egypt, and we're going to continue to monitor those this week. And Moshe, as you mentioned, it has been six months since the attacks on October 7th, and there are still more than 100 hostages, uh, people who are were kidnapped on October 7th. And this weekend, I know I saw a lot of hostage families really speaking out, trying to call attention to it. And a lot of them just really feel forgotten and, and feel that President Biden has totally forgotten them and, and, and that they're just kind of, you know, afterthoughts in this war. Yeah, as the storyline has moved to the um, suffering in Gaza, um, they're trying to continue to call attention um, to uh, their friends and family that continue to be held there uh, and effectively be bargaining chips. Um, Jill, we should note, too, that on Friday, the Israelis put out their preliminary report. They fired several senior officers in the aftermath of the drone attack. Uh, that killed seven aid workers belonging to World Central Kitchen. That's Jose Andres's charity. The Israelis say that uh, what took place was unacceptable. Um, they are um, they are engaged in they are engaged in training. Uh, and again, uh, several people have lost their jobs there. Though the World Central Kitchen and Jose Andres are calling for an independent investigation uh, beyond what the Israelis have already released. From the Wall Street Journal, across the United States, insurance companies are using aerial images of homes as a tool to ditch properties that are seen as higher risk. Nearly every building in the country is being photographed, often without the owner's knowledge. Companies are deploying drones, manned airplanes, and high-altitude balloons to take images of properties. No place is shielded. The industry-funded Geospatial Insurance Consortium has an airplane imagery program. It says it covers about 99% of the U.S. population. The photos are sorted, computer models to spy out underwriting no-nos, things like damaged roof shingles, yard debris, overhanging tree branches, and undeclared swimming pools or trampolines. The red flagged images are providing insurers with ammunition for non-renewal notices nationwide. There has been an increase across the country in reports from consumers who've been dropped by their insurers on the basis of an aerial image. The increasingly sophisticated use of flyby photos comes as home insurers nationwide scramble to de-risk their property portfolios, dropping less than perfect homes in an effort to recover from big underwriting losses. Yeah, remember, uh, home insurers are dealing with climate issues, uh, flooding issues, a, a whole bunch of claims in recent years, as well as insurance fraud. So they're finding new ways to, again, as you mentioned, de-risk their portfolios. This story uh, struck a nerve, Jill, and got a lot of attention in the Wall Street Journal over the weekend. Insurers say that customers agree to home inspections when they buy a policy, and that photographing properties from the sky is less intrusive than actually visiting your home. Hmm. They say, I don't know. <laughs> they say they deploy fleets of surveillance planes. Let's. They say that deploying fleets of surveillance planes lets them respond more quickly to disasters and charge rates that better reflect the property's risk. Uh, according to the Allstate CEO, 
adding digital images is improving underwriting, and there's even more to come. Uh, he says, this is Tom Wilson, the CEO of Allstate. If your roof is 20 years old and one hailstorm is going to take it off, you should pay more than somebody with a brand new roof. But at the same time, not all these images are totally accurate, Jill. The story goes into the fact that they're not up to date all the time. And so uh, sometimes you are getting dropped by your insurance for an image that was taken randomly two years ago. Uh, one former farmer's insurance employee quit and speaks to the Wall Street Journal. She says it was getting inappropriate in terms of how they were conducting themselves. Um, Non-renewal notices being sent for everything from a trampoline in the backyard to moss on the side of a vacation home. Again, some from images that were several years old. Though aerial images are expected now to become increasingly detailed, if satellite launches go as planned, you know, all these satellite launches you hear from SpaceX, etc., a lot of satellites are going up. And then those will include satellites that are exclusively devoted to uh, photos for insurance companies. By the year 2030, so in about five years, they could be getting images on a daily basis, like surveilling your house on a daily basis. Uh, and so there are some privacy concerns there that the uh, law hasn't caught up with that. So just a, a notable thing that uh, the insurance companies flying planes, balloons, satellites over your house. So that isn't my neighbor's kid just playing around with a drone. That's the sound, that's the insurance company. <laughs> Got it. No, Joe, that's the sound of the good hands you're in with Allstate. <laughs> All right, from ABC News, a Powerball player in Oregon won a jackpot worth more than $1.3 billion on Sunday, ending a winless streak that had stretched more than three months. The single ticket matched all six numbers drawn to win the jackpot worth $1.326 billion. The jackpot has a cash value of $621 million if the winner chooses to take a lump sum rather than an annuity paid over 30 years with an immediate payout followed by 29 annual installments. Oh, to what have are you such taking, problems, Moshe? Jill. You always <laughs> take the lump sum, Jill. You got to take the lump sum. Hmm. Okay. I. You pay the federal taxes on it, then you got to pay the state taxes on it. Still, you're doing pretty well there. <laughs> uh, not much work besides buying that lotto ticket at your local uh, gas station. To win the lotto in America, a reminder, typically is a one in 292 million chance you have a better luck. You have better odds of getting struck by lightning than winning the lotto. Still, uh, Jill, you know, they took that chance. And someone in Oregon and their kids and grandkids and great-grandkids never have to work again technically. Uh, again, no one had won since New Year's Day, 41 straight drawings. And so this prize is the eighth largest in American history. And finally, from the AP, the world's oldest man says the secret to his long life is luck, moderation, and fish and chips every Friday. And Englishman John Alfred Tinniswood, who is 111 years old, has been confirmed as the new holder of the title by Guinness World Records. It follows the death of the Venezuelan record holder Juan Vicente Perez this month at the age of 114. Another man from Japan who was the next longest living, he died on March 31st at the age of 112. Tennis Wood was presented with a certificate by Guinness World Records on Thursday at the care home where he lives in Southport, Northwest England. So it's a great record to have, Jill, but sadly, typically short-lived. That said, we're still going to celebrate Tennis Wood here. For some perspective, he was born in Liverpool in the year 1912. So uh, we know Liverpool for a few things, including the Beatles. But he's so old, he was in his 50s when the Beatles first uh, <laughs> got out there and became popular. He was actually born just a couple uh, months after the sinking of the Titanic, again, for perspective. So he's a retired accountant, great-grandfather. Moderation, he says, is key here. He never smokes. He rarely drinks. He follows no special diet apart from, as you mentioned, a fish and chip supper once a week. He tells the AP, if you drink too much or you eat too much or you walk too much, if you do too much of anything, you're going to suffer eventually. Good advice. I like the walking part. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> even good stuff, moderation. Don't do too much of anything. Uh, for context here, women tend to live longer than men, uh, generally speaking, and that also applies with the oldest record holder. Uh, while the oldest man in the world is 111, the oldest woman in the world is 117. Uh, she is in Spain. Speaking of birthdays from a long time ago, on this day in history, Jill, happy birthday, Buddha, at least in Japan, where it's commemorated on April 8th. Buddha, of course, the founder of the faith, uh, born somewhere in India between the 6th century and 4th century BCE, 
though notably different countries celebrate Buddha's birthday at different times. Uh, Japan, again, commemorates it on April 8th, uh, but then uh, depending on where you go, Vietnam, Laos, Taiwan, etc., it's uh, various dates throughout the spring. But here on the Mo News podcast, we're going to commemorate it on April 8th with our friends in Japan. Buddhists actually believe that there were several Buddhas or enlightened teachers uh, throughout history, yet the title The Buddha typically refers to the historical figure Siddhartha Gautama, who went on to found Buddhism, again, just about 2,400 years ago. All right, we're going to fast forward to the 20th century here. On this day in 1994, rock star Kurt Cobain was found dead in his home in Seattle from suicide. He was only 27 years old. He had risen to fame as the leader as the leader and chief songwriter of Nirvana, which was one of the uh, superstar bands of the grunge movement of the early 90s. Smells Like Teen Spirit, still a pretty incredible album. And also staying in 1994, this week in history, marked the beginning of the genocide in Rwanda. There was a ceremony that was held over the weekend, uh, remembering the more than 800,000 people who were murdered in just about 100 days there in Rwanda as an ethnic conflict uh, took place between the Hutu and Tutsi ethnic groups. It resulted in the murder of mainly Tutsis. The world did little to stop it. France and the U.S. have both apologized and apologized again over the weekend for not doing enough. Bill Clinton who was president at the time, actually was in Rwanda this weekend leading the American delegation. Uh, intelligence has come out that the U.S. actually knew uh, that uh, genocide may happen there, but did nothing because at the time we were still in the aftermath of Black Hawk Down, and so there was a lot of reluctance at the White House to get involved in anything on the continent at that point. And one more item on this day in history. In 2009, the Marsk, Alabama, the ship was hijacked off the coast of Somalia. You may have seen the uh, film, Captain Phillips with Tom Hanks. Uh, that was the telling of this story. Pirates came aboard the ship. Most of the crew uh, went to a safe room, though three pirates fled in a lifeboat with Captain Phillips, taking him with them. Uh, there was a standoff with the U.S. Navy. Eventually, Navy SEAL snipers opened fire on the lifeboat, hit all three pirates, uh, were able to save Captain Phillips. One of the surviving pirates from the initial raid uh, was then sentenced to more than three decades in prison in the U.S. Again, uh, you can see it all unfold, even though I sort of blew it for you here on the podcast uh, in the uh, Tom Hanks film. I think we said after a couple of decades, spoilers are allowed, right? Yes. Yes, I think so. Especially historical ones, right? <laughs> so, right. so last week we told you the plot of Titanic. And, and today, <laughs> Captain Phillips. All right, uh, a couple TV items here. On this day, 45 years ago, if you're from a certain generation, you remember that theme song, All in the Family, a classic sitcom that delved into lots of serious issues at the time, including race and culture, over on CBS with uh, Carol O'Connor, the actor who played Archie Bunker. And finally, Jill, the clue I told you about at the top of the uh, podcast, 24 years ago today, a classic sketch on Saturday Night Live premiered Will Ferrell as a cowbell player, Christopher Walken as the producer who can't get enough. Most, they don't make SNL skits like they used to. No, you know, I watched over the weekend, Kristen Wiig returned to SNL as the uh, host. And there are a couple of good sketches, but like it wasn't, like I wanted the Californians to come back and Penelope. I mean, she had some classic sketches that they didn't bring back last night, but that, that they didn't bring back on Saturday night. But uh, yeah, there's just... I don't know. I feel like uh, I'm, I'm waiting for SNL to have one of its uh, periods again where, like, they, they bring us sketches that I remember, you know, 25 years later. Okay, Lauren Michaels, we're waiting. We're waiting. All right, that is it for us. Thank you for listening to the Mo News Podcast. If you like what you hear, share this with your friends. It will help us grow. Follow us and subscribe so you don't miss an episode and review us in the App Store. See you guys tomorrow. Don't look at the sun too long. Okay. <laughs>